Hi, I'm John Council. I'm a senior reporter with Texas Lawyer Newspaper, and welcome to the July 14th, 2008 edition of Reversed and Remanded. Hadn't had a, a new show in a couple of weeks, uh, but we've now revived it, and Randy Johnston is my guest today. He is a partner at Dallas's Johnston Toby, and Randy sues lawyers for a living. He's a legal malpractice lawyer. And I got a couple of topics that are sorted within your um, world, Randy. The first is a case that's scheduled to go to trial at Houston this week. And this is, I think this is um, my story for this week. I think it's fascinating. It's the estate of a late lawyer who was an Andrews and Kurth partner up until he died in 1975. And he was... Howard Hughes's business lawyer for about a decade. I mean, very involved in representing Mr. Hughes before he died in 1976. And here is the, what the suit is about. It's, a re, it's essentially, for lack of a better term, a breach of fiduciary duty suit in which the, Mr., the lawyer's name is Raymond Cook, the late lawyer, late Raymond Cook, his estate has sued Andrews and Kurth, alleging that According to the partnership agreement that Mr. Cook signed in about 1972, if if and when he died, it is his successors would get his partnership share from Andrews and Kirk, which was about 40 percent, which would last 40 percent of what Mr. Cook would have gotten would have last about five years, and then a 25 percent share in the sixth year. And the dispute is over Howard Hughes's estate. Andrews and Kirk represented Howard Hughes's, I guess, maternal heirs and had a contingent fee arrangement. Howard Hughes just keeps on giving. Keeps really on giving. Hurt. I think people are still fighting about his <laughs> estate 32 years later. And uh, the, the dispute here is the Cook estate is alleging that they are due a share of this, uh, of Andrews and Kerr's representation during the Hughes estate matter. Right. And Andrews and Kerr says, no, 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 that money was contingent, but we didn't get it until after the partnership agreement, after the, that five or six year period. That's when they first started getting the money in. So you don't, you aren't entitled to anything. Um, so here's the question: Did they have a fiduciary? Did Andrews and Kerr, the law firm, have a fiduciary duty to advise the administrator of the Cook estate about this fee and either give them a say in that arrangement or give them a or, or structure the deal in such a way that the the Cook Estate would get a cut. What do you think? Fascinating, fascinating case. Andrews Kurth represented Hughes Tool and the Hughes Estate forever. Forever, and yeah. The, the amount of money that they have made through good legal representation of, yeah. of those entities is, is mind-boggling. And the amount of money involved here is truly mind-boggling as well. I start with the premise that law firms um, have the right to handle their own receivables and their yep. own contingency fee arrangements. And ex-partners don't get to come in and dictate how a law firm runs the law firm. Yeah. On the other hand, it's absolutely clear that law firms have a fiduciary relationship to the partners, and in this case, perhaps because of these contractual arrangements, even to ex-partners, to act in their best interest to collect fees, to not write them off for some personal benefit. Right. And the one thing that, the one place where I think the ice is real thick uh, is a law firm doesn't get to restructure or postpone some receivable for the specific purpose of denying an ex-partner a share in it. Right. Now, I don't know what the facts of this case will be, right. but if I were representing the Cook Estate, I would be pushing towards that kind of a finding. Right. I would be looking for evidence and trying to persuade a jury that this wasn't just the law firm running its business in the ordinary course and making reasonable, sound business judgment decisions. Yeah. In fact, these were decisions made for the sole purpose of denying Mr. Cook and his estate millions of dollars. And if they prove that, then I think they may end up with a judgment that they could hold on to on appeal. Yeah, well, this is going to be a great fight. I mean, the Anderson Kirk does, does a pretty strong argument that, look, we yes, this was a contingency agreement, but we didn't get any money until after the partnership essentially ended between the Cook estate and Andrews and Kirk. And, you know, we, get, we got money after his five or six years were up. So, uh, and they're also saying that the administrator of, of the Cook State knew about this fee agreement, but, uh, you know, 
That's why this, I guess, has gotten a lot of fact questions and why it's going a lot to get of fact questions. That's why it's ready for a jury, I guess. I wish I were in Houston. It will, it'll be an interesting trial to watch. I'd be willing to bet there's going to be a lot of legal heavyweights in that court. Oh, yeah. The, these are good lawyers in this case. All right. Uh, our feature story this week is called Super Wise Me. And it's, a, <laughs> it's about uh, lawyers who learn everything they need to know about being a lawyer and being successful by working in fast food. And so my first question for you, Randy, is what was your first job? So fits your theme, John. <laughs> uh, my friends in Amarillo may remember this if you're old enough. Uh, my first job was at Tweety's Hamburgers in Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> Sold hamburgers for 25 cents each. How much did you make, Randy? I made a dollar twenty-five an hour. Oh my gosh! So, what did you learn about that experience, Lane? Ray, that you didn't want to work in fast food for the rest of your life? You know, that's a, a lesson that certainly was there, and I would have learned that lesson if I had been allowed to work a little longer. How long did you work? I was fired after two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was fired for uh, getting in a fight with a fellow employee uh, while I was on duty. It wasn't in the restaurant. We went right. into the back of the restaurant and. Uh, in terms of life lessons yeah. there, uh, I've learned that sometimes, uh, even though you can pick a fight that you're going to win, you're better off not fighting and winning, not fighting than you are fighting and winning. Especially if the guy's bigger than you. Well, and then I also learned that there are some fights that, by golly, you just have to pick them even though you know you're going to lose. Yeah. Just go in and take your beating because you, you, it's more important to have fought and lost than not fought. Yeah, great. Okay, Randy, it's now time to put you in what I like to call the witness stand. I'm going to ask Randy some random questions and see what he has to say. All right, first one. Randy, since you're a legal malpractice lawyer, do you like your chances of ever becoming state bar president? <laughs> no, but not for that reason. Uh, that's a position I've never really been interested in, yeah. never really even fully understood. I know those guys give up typically two years of their law practice, the year they're president-elect and the year they're president. Uh, and I don't completely understand why, but I'd much rather practice law than be state bar president. I don't blame you. Okay, Randy. And I, you notice how carefully I avoided saying that they wouldn't vote for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Randy. If I sign up a client, if I set clients with a nine-tenths contingent fee contract, Am I going to eventually get a call from Randy Johnston? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is uh, the whole contingency fee contract uh, situation is so interesting to me because lawyers forget that we are not free to contract on any basis we want. That yeah. There is an ethical ceiling and you cannot contract for a fee above that, even if the client is willing. And every lawyer who practices on a contingent fee, John, I promise you, They've had a lawyer, I mean, they've had a prospective client come in and say, I don't even want any of this. You can have it all. Yeah. And you have to tell them, I can't take it all. I'm, I can take a third, maybe 40%. Uh, some lawyers think it can go as high as 50%. I have a standing rule that I never take more than 50% with the combination of fees and expenses. I just think you do the bar such a disservice if the lawyer gets more than the client. The warning shot's been fired across the bow. All right. Uh, Randy, when is the Texas legislature going to crack down on all these frivolous lawsuits filed against lawyers? <laughs> I don't know, but I hope they do it soon because that will drive my competition out of business and then they'll only be me left with all the good lawsuits that need to be filed that aren't frivolous. Okay, last question. Should the Eagles be allowed to put out any more albums? Uh, well... I'm going to have to say, yeah, let them go ahead and put out another album. Just don't call it something, you know, involving yet one more trip to hell. Okay. Hell freezes over or something like that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Randy. It's my pleasure, John. All right. Thanks for asking me.